The first floor is always open for questions because I may not say what uh, you're wanting to know about. I may not talk about it unless you ask me about it. Um, I will give you an answer, and if I don't know the answer, I'll make up something and you'll think I know it. So. <laughs> Sound like a county agent. That's very good. I would work for the government, couldn't I? <laughs> you could. <laughs> but uh, anyway, seriously, ask questions. Uh, uh, it don't even have to be on topic. If it's about bees, we'll talk about it. But this talk is supposed to be about what bothers bees and how to take care of it. And the number one thing that you're, for the last, since 1989, you would have heard that varroa mites are the major, the main pest for honeybees. And they're still on the list. They're, they're still way up there. But uh, we've gotten pretty good at killing varroa mites if you do it. If, if you follow the protocols and, and uh, do the right thing, use the right treatments, you can keep your varroa count pretty low. But you have to do it. I mean, you, you can't be slack about uh, taking care of your mite issue. You don't need to use the same thing two times in a row. Just like uh, you don't need to keep using glyphosate on weeds to kill weeds because they become tolerant of it. You don't need to use the same mite treatment on varroa over and over and over and over because they're likely to become tolerant of it. Now some mite treatments kill mites in a different way. And than others. Some varroa are a lot less likely to become tolerant of because they break down the exoskeleton of the varroa mite. And uh, those are the acids, oxalic and formic acid. They're less likely to become tolerant of those. Uh, thymol, next in line, less likely to become, a little bit less likely to become tolerant of thymol. The hard chemicals, they are they're likely to become tolerant of them. They've already become resistant to uh, fluvalinate. That was the first mite treatment that we had for varroa mites is fluvalinate and apistan strips. And apistan, uh, I was lucky enough to get to do a study on that for a company last year that uh, wanted to see how effective apistan was against mites. Now, the theory was that since we've been using other things to kill varroa mites, maybe we've killed all of them that carry this tolerance to apistan, and maybe apistan fluvalinate might be a good treatment again for varroa mites. And the study was uh, 20 hives in a control group, nothing's used. 20 hives where only apistan is used. 20 hives where epigard was used. Apigard is thymol. Thymol treatment. Uh, and 20 hives were both apistan and apigard were used at the same time. The results of this study were kind of what I figured they would be, with a few surprise, a couple of surprises. Uh, first, the apistan was 52% effective, meaning that there were 52% less mites in the hive at the end of the study as opposed to the beginning of it. The end of the treatment, 52% less mites in the hives. Apistan by itself. Um, Apigard, thymol by itself, was 74% effective. 74% less mites in the hive. Apistan plus Apigard, 76%. You only gain 2% by using both, both of them. Now, the two kind of wild cards there is the control group was 20% lower in mites. In other words, the bees had taken care of 20% of the mites without any intervention at all. 20% lower mite count. This was done in August, August and September, when the mite count should have been out running the production by the queen. So it was 20% lower just with nothing. That was the control group. The way I'm looking at this, 
you should take that 20% right off the top of the other treatments, which would make Apistan 32% effective. And you know, take the 20% off because the bees were doing 20% by themselves without any help. But the other thing was that of the hives that had Apigard in them, the thymol treatment, it got hot, pretty hot, where these bees were in West Kentucky last, October, last August and September. It was pretty hot. 20% of the hives had skunk. So I guess you would say that was 100% control because there wasn't any mites in them. There wasn't any bees in them either. But the thymol drove anything that had thymol in it when it got up to 92, 93 degrees, the, mite, the bees just left. So uh, those are things to take into consideration when you're deciding what to treat mites with. At the same time, I treated 20 hives with what I use to treat mites with, and it was over 90% effective. <laughs> so, uh, in other words, I'm not changing my mind on what I was treating my mites with, because what I was using worked, and I used three different things to treat with. Spring, I used thymol. Cool weather, it, it is effective against mites in cool weather especially. In cool weather, it does not run the bees out of the hive. Summer, I use formic acid, but I don't apply the formic acid the way that uh, it's supposed to be applied. Uh, it's not something that I can recommend people to do because it's a shock treatment of formic acid. It's in and it's out, same day. Uh, but it knocks the mites down to the point that you can get into early winter. Early winter, I treat with, with uh, either thymol again or with uh, amitraz, which is acobar strips. Mites will become resistant to amitraz at some point. Amitraz is a close cousin of fluvalinate, so it's just a matter of time before they're, they're tolerant of it. But the thymol, they're not as likely to become tolerant of that. And uh, formic acid, they're not, they're really not likely to be tolerant of that. Those are the treatments I use for varroa. And we don't have many issues with varroa. But varroa is not really the worst problem that we see in bees. Yeah. The worst problem is the, the diseases and viruses that varroa bring into the hive. Because once those get into the hive, they become systemic in the hive and you don't have to have varroa for those to keep building in your hive. The bees themselves become the vectors uh, by feeding larvae and also by trophallaxis, sharing feed one to another. And also, if the queen mates with a drone that's infected with a virus, he passes that virus on to the queen. Every bee that comes from an egg that the queen lays that was fertilized with the sperm of that infected drone is infected. And that's a, that's a relatively new finding, that the viruses can be transmitted venereally. So, you know, it's amazing to me that all the bees don't just have viruses out the wazoo, but, but they don't. Um, there's a bacterial brood disease that's usually identified as European fowl brood. It's not really European fowl brood, but that's how it's identified. And uh, it's actually associated with parasitic mite syndrome. It used to just be called parasitic mite syndrome. Well, now it's kind of the only, it's the only leftover from parasitic mite syndrome. All the other stuff has kind of fell to the wayside but you still see this twisted up brood, twisted up larva in the cells. And uh, eventually it'll look like it's melted in the crease of the cell. Larva, shouldn't, larva should never be lying lengthwise in a cell. If it is, it's sick. And that is usually identified by inspectors as European fowl brood. It's okay, don't correct them because you can get a feed directive to get teramycin if you just let them go ahead and say it's European fowl brood. One treatment will fix it. 
teramycin. It, it'll stop that uh, particular brood disease. Now the interesting part is that if you treat the hive for this bacterial brood disease, you'll also stop the viruses in the hive. They just quit being evident. Uh, there's only there's only like four viruses that have a visual symptom that you can identify and say, well, yeah, that's that. This is black queen cell virus, or this is a deformed wing virus. Or, this is acute paralysis. Uh, there's only four that you can identify. There's 27, 28 viruses, some, something like that. That that's just what we know about. Those are the ones that have been numbered, and there's no visible symptoms to them. I'll guarantee you, if you send a sample of your bees to Beltsville, the lab in Maryland, you're going to find more than likely some percentage of Lake Sinai virus in your bees. Just about everybody has it. Normally, it don't kill your colony. Once in a while, it will, and that's the that's the symptom. I, I participated in a study uh, three years ago for or that uh, came back, well, you got Lake Sinai virus. And I was like, wow, what's that? And uh, I called, at that time, there was a man working at Beltsville that I knew. And I called him, and uh, he said, yeah, everybody's got it. I said, well, what's the symptom? And he said, well, you go to your hive, usually in the winter, and there's no bees in it. I said, well, that's some symptom. What am I supposed to do about it? And he said, well, get more bees and put in it. <laughs> yeah, it helps a lot. And uh, there's no visible symptom to it. The symptom is your bees leave the hive for no apparent reason. They abscond for no apparent reason. They leave honey in the hive. They leave brood in the hive. Sometimes they leave a little ball of bees in the hive, but most of your adult bees leave the hive. <clears throat> and uh, sounds a lot like CCD, but it's not really because nobody ever really said what CCD is. It's just a cool catchphrase. But uh, anyway, that's Lake Sinai virus. Most everybody has has some of it in their bees. Excuse me. Yes. So they take the disease, the virus, with them when, yep. when they leave. So the, the comb is when, not contaminated. Comb is not contaminated. These viruses, these viruses can't survive without a host. And the reason honeybees leave a hive in in the winter or any time really. The, the reason the entire colony absconds, it's a survival mechanism. And uh, it, you can see the survival mechanism really well in African bees. Because in Africa there's a bunch of stuff that tears up hives and, and kills the bees and eats the honey, and destroys the hive. And the survival mechanism for that African colony is to just leave. Well our bees have that same instinct when when some, there's something in the hive that they cannot overcome. And who knows where that switch gets flipped? Uh, I don't know. I expect that some colonies have a higher tolerance to, to certain things than other colonies. I suspect that because I've had colonies abscond from a hive that had, uh, that had a patch of small hive beetle larva this big around on one frame. And the bees said, well, that's enough of this. There goes the neighborhood. I'm out of here. And they, they just, the whole hive just left. I thought it was a huge swarm. And I was like, wow, that's going to be a nice one to catch. And uh, so I caught it. And I thought, this looks like every bee in a hive come out. And I went to the hive where I suspected they came from because I saw it when it began happening. There wasn't nothing in it. There was a patch of small hive beetle larvae about this big around. On the other hand, I've seen hives that had a full frame of small hive beetle larvae in it that were living just fine with it. So obviously they had a higher tolerance to beetle larvae. But uh, an entire colony will leave the hive when they perceive they cannot overcome the problem that's in the hive. And if that problem is a virus that we can't even see, recognize visually, you don't know really what it is. But they left the hive. And I was uh, discussing this with a friend of mine that's a, a really smart person that 
does research and writes papers and does all that kind of thing. And uh, this person said, well, how, how does that help anything? They don't survive. And I told her that it's not about the survival of the individual bee. It's not even about the survival of the colony, but their instinct drives them to leave the hive for the survival of the species. Because if they leave the hive, whatever's in that hive has no host, and it dies. They die, and the disease dies, and it don't spread. The viruses, viruses uh, are not nearly as persistent because they don't reproduce by spores. Uh, organisms that reproduce by spores are extremely persistent, especially like American fowl brood, because the spores go dormant. A European fowl brood also reproduces by spores, but their spores do not go dormant. So they have to have a, a continual host. American fowl brood spores don't have to have a host. Uh, they can lay dormant for an unknown number of years and reanimate when, when they're ingested by larva at the right stage of the larva's life. Nosema serrana reproduces by spores and those spores go dormant just like American fowl root. Nosema apis reproduces by spores. The spores do not go dormant and when there's no host, Nosema apis dies. Nosema serrana does not. So knowing these things kind of helps you know what tack to take when you have a, an issue in a hive. If you have American fowl brood, right now the option is burning the hive. That, that's what needs to be done. There are some things coming online that we may have available to us within the next few years that will kill American fowl brood. It's effective to kill it. It's another organism that feeds on American fowl brood spores, which is pretty amazing to me. They finally found the predator for American fowl brood. And when it consumes the American fowl brood spores and there's none of those left, it consumes itself and it's gone. So uh, that, that may be available to us within the next few years. Who knows? Uh, you can't tell about what's going to be approved and what's not. But uh, anyway, right now the protocol is burn it. If you have American fowl brood, burn it. European fowl brood or the parasitic mite fowl brood, any antibiotic will treat it. Any antibiotic stops it cold. You can remove the host by spreading powdered sugar or flour on the open larva in the hive. You can remove the host because the bees remove that, it kills it. You lose 10 days of brood production because three days is an egg, seven days is a larva. You lose that amount of brood production, but it removes the host and the bacteria that causes this uh, parasitic mite syndrome, fowl brood, can't survive without a host for more than 72 hours. So it's gone. It, you remove the host, you remove the pest but you've not removed the primary vector, which is either the varroa mite or the bees, one or the other. So you have to make sure your hive is clean of varroa mites. And if, if the bees themselves have become a vector with this bacterial disease, then an antibiotic is your only treatment, your only viable treatment. You can get a veterinary feed director. You just have to go through the motions. You have to get an inspector to look at the brood and say, yep, that's, that's European fowl brood. And uh, they'll write you a, a prescription, basically, your veterinary will, so that you can get some Terrapro or some kind of Terramycin from, uh, from a veterinary or farm store. And you apply it uh, according to the label. Easy to apply, easy treatment. One treatment will kill it. It'll be done with. Those are really what have become the primary pest in our beehives. Those are the things that you're going to see going wrong in the hive that you can control, that you can have something to do with. Your bees probably have no Zima serrana. It's probably not going to kill it. Probably not going to kill the colony. 
A honeybee colony can overcome one stressor pretty easy, unless the stressor is American fowl brood. It can overcome that one stressor. When you add a second stressor, they may not thrive and they may survive. Two stressors, two major stressors, and you're kind of on the fence there. Three is going to die. You put three things together going wrong in a hive, and you got some problems. You're, you're going to have to do something to get that hive back on the track. And uh, stressors can come in all shapes and sizes and forms because we're also a stressor ourselves. By working, working through a hive of bees, that stresses a hive of bees. My bees are highly stressed because they move across country. That's a major stress on a colony of bees. Being picked up, put on a tractor trailer with 400 and some odd other hives with a net over them or that they can't fly and forage, but they can share bees and pheromones with all these other hives and then set down in another part of the country where they are totally lost and the weather is totally different and the bloom is really different and that's a major stressor. So our bees have to be clean of everything when they move and when they come home they need to be clean of everything. So I, I treat our bees. I had rather be in a position to just keep bees and not have to put anything in them, in the hive, to keep them alive, but I can't. Uh, when you're in a position like I am, the best thing I can recommend is to use the least toxic me method of control for whatever that you're trying to control. Nozema, we don't have uh, fumigellin available anymore. So, uh, and, and even if we did, that was a poor treatment for Nozema. You knock the spores way down and they just spike. When they came back, they would spike. And uh, you would just set the bar a little bit higher for what you had to kill the next time. But uh, probiotics are a really good treatment for Nozema as far as as far as trying to not kill the Nozema but to put enough good bacteria and good flora in the mid gut of the bee that the Nozema don't make much difference. Uh, after you feed an <coughs> antibiotic that's going to pretty much wipe out the bacteria in the mid gut of your bees and it's good to feed a probiotic in the in in your syrup or in your feed, after you feed, that after you treat with teramycin or what tylosin or whatever you're treating with, if you treat with that, a good follow-up is feeding sugar syrup with a probiotic in it. Pro DFM is good. The probiotics that you get at the farm store are just about as good. The probiotics and electrolytes that are for poultry, they work just as good on bees. There's nothing in there that's toxic to the bees, and uh, it has most of the same things that Pro DFM has. And I'm not a salesman for any of these things. It's just that uh, I don't mind telling people what has worked for me, and I'm not going to badmouth any product or any particular style of management. If you don't want to treat your bees, that's okay. I mean, just understand what you're likely to see. If you don't treat your bees, you probably will see this. And if you see this, then your next step of action is going to be something else. But eventually, your bees are going to die, regardless of how good you take care of them. So the most important thing is uh, knowing how to take one hive and multiply it. Take one hive and make three or four out of it in a year. And if you can make, uh, if you can take one good hive at the beginning of the spring and split it into three hives, three moderate hives, and then make one more split later in the summer, you may, you've taken one and made four from it. You can sustain a 75% loss every year. 
and still keep your numbers of bees right. Um, I don't recommend that, but uh, I mean, I recommend splitting your bees, but I don't recommend being happy with 75% loss. But just keep in mind, you can sustain your numbers of bees if you know how to make more bees. Learning how to do that is really important in staying in business beekeeping. Whether your business is two hives or 200 hives or 2,000 hives, you've got to know how to make more bees. The second part of this equation is understanding what different diseases and pest problems look like and how to fix them. And that's something that you just learn. You learn how to fix Varroa by coming and doing something like this. Talk to people that keep their bees alive and see what they do. Uh, that's the best way, that's the best advice I can give you for knowing how to keep your bees alive. Regardless of what is in a book or a magazine or on YouTube or whatever, uh, talk to somebody that keeps their bees alive and makes money with them and you can get a good idea of what needs to be done to keep your bees alive. Now, <laughs> treatment can go all over the place. There's some stuff that uh, you can talk to one beekeeper and they'll say, well, yeah, if you put this in there, that'll, that'll kill it. Well, yeah, but I mean, it'd kill me too. <laughs> There's some things that I, I just wouldn't recommend putting in a hive that are very effective. The reason I wouldn't recommend putting them in a hive is because there's other things that are effective too that are a lot less toxic. Now, after saying that, believe me, if I have to put plutonium in a hive to take care of the pest, I'll do it, provided I can get it off eBay or something. But uh, I make my living with bees. They got to stay alive. So, do you produce honey, or are you? Yes, just... ma'am. Oh, yeah. I, I produce honey too. There are treatments that you can use for varroa mites on honey, but we treat our mites uh, early in the spring. Treat our bees for mites early in the spring, before honey supers go on, and then as soon as they come off of honey, the honey flow, which is right at this time of year they come off a of honey flow, we'll pull the honey supers off of them and treat them again. And we don't have much of a fall, late, late summer and fall honey flow where I live. So we just concentrate on getting the bees healthy to go back to Florida in September. And we get the bees healthy and queen right and make everything as good as possible to go back to Florida. And they go into a bee yard in Florida and uh, they produce honey down there and there's no treatment on them there. But when they come off of the honey flow in Florida, we split everything that can be split, and uh, as long as it will braid out, for as long as there's 10 frames of bees, we make everything 10 frames of bees or more, and we treat it again for mites, and if there's any brood disease, we'll treat it then for that also. But there's no honey supers on it then. Then they go to almonds in California, and they're not treated out there. There's a honey super on them out there, and they're not treated, but when they come back to Kentucky, there's no honey super on them. It's spraying again, and we're, we're, we flip back around. And you have to do that not only because for the health, but because you're transporting across but, state because lines, I'm, right? Because I'm transporting them, and the main reason that I treat them, if, if I had a hive, if my hives all stayed on my farm all year long, I would probably only have to treat them once a year. Maybe not even that. But my hives are in bee yards that are, well, like the bee yard, the holding yard our hives were in, in California, there were 7,700 hives in the holding yard. And mine were a very small percentage of that. So you run about, what, 1,000 hives or 500? No, no, closer to 500 than 1,000. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it is a lot more work than I meant for it to be. I'll put it that way. And and when you were talking about uh, the coming to the end of the honey flow, the next flow, uh, do you think this is that we're in a dearth? 
environment, a drought environment, because you know we were just gangbusters two weeks ago, and now it's just really winding down. Yeah, it. it uh, we haven't you'll find that a honey flow starts really quick, and it stops really quick. It, it's very seldom this nice slow build up and nice slow drawdown. It's usually just bang, it's on, and then bang, it is off. And uh, as soon as you notice that your bees are not foraging the way that they were, uh, you need to take note of that. If you're gonna take the honey off, then you gotta make sure it's capped. So you're walking kind of a fine line there. You don't wanna feed the bees syrup because you don't want the syrup mixed in with your honey. Right. On the other hand, you don't want the queen to start going backwards and stop laying eggs, start stop producing broods. Some some birds, some queens, some uh, races of queens will. Uh, Do you work with a queen excluder? I use a queen excluder for very specific things, but uh, not like you would think. That I mean, not to keep her out of the honey supers or. I, I use a queen excluder during the main honey flow. When they come back from almonds, uh, there's, there's no queen excluder on the bees in almonds. So they build up into two deeps. That's what I want, because I want to be able to take frames out of those that have honey pollen and bees on them, and brood of all ages. And that's what you get when you don't have a queen excluder on. You have frames that, that are right. full of everything, or not full, but have some of everything on it. And that's what I want coming out of almonds. And I split those in the spring and I put them into single deeps and put a queen excluder, scratch the honey open so that they have to do something with it and on the frames and put a queen excluder over that single deep and then put another deep on top of that for them to produce honey in. They'll, most of the time, they'll move that honey that I scratched open, they'll move it up into that into that next super and they'll fill they'll put honey in that second story that's above the queen excluder but i don't use queen excluder for that purpose any time other than that when uh, the bees are in florida making uh, building up down there i don't i don't have a queen excluder because there again i want a frame that's got everything on it so i can make splits with it and uh, there's only one one time a year where I have a queen excluder and on to keep the queen out of the honey supers. I do use a queen excluder for queen right uh, cell builders and for queen banks, for uh, queen cell banks and things like that. I use a queen excluder for that, but those are very specific purposes. And uh, our, our bees that uh, come off of a honey flow, sometimes they're about honey bound because the, the bees have put a lot of honey down in that bottom bottom deep. And we wind up having to scatter out frames that have bees and have honey, separate all that out. And sometimes we extract almost as much honey out of the brood nest as we do out of the honey soup. And then you filter it. Do you still have? Do you have cat brood in? No, we, we don't. Uh, we don't extract any frames that have cat brood or have brood on it. Uh, we will extract a frame that has pollen on it or bee bread. Yeah. But not one that has any brood on it. The the brood is more valuable to me than the honey. Sure. Yes. Plus, I I don't really want to eat worm guts, and I don't figure anybody else does either. <laughs> so, <laughs> it also makes honey ferment quicker if you put that in there and you have some high moisture honey. But, the, you know, for the pests and things that, things that go wrong in hives and how to fix it, knowing what you're looking at when you take a frame out is, is key. And uh, knowing what to do about it, that's, that's also equally as important, knowing how to fix the problem. Uh, you're not gonna have that much problem in those even. You're, you should have plenty of weapons to combat varroa and you know how to fix the brood diseases. You fix the brood disease and you fix the, the viruses also. 
and that takes care of all of that. Um, other pests and parasites, uh, tracheal mice just aren't that big of an issue in, in our bees anymore. I've checked bees for tracheal mites uh, off and on for probably the last 10 years. I just don't see any damage from tracheal mites. I don't see any tracheal mites themselves. When I've sent bees to Beltsville, um, I send a sample about every three years just to make sure I'm not missing something. And they never come back with any tracheal mites. So uh, they're just not that big of an issue for us. Uh, American fowl brood, not that big of an issue. There, there has been an outbreak. And calling it an outbreak is, is really a disservice because uh, they're referring to one frame in one hive that had a little bit of American fowl brood on it as an outbreak. You know, that's like, uh, <laughs> that, that's kind of overblown, really. Now, it is American fowl brood, and it does need to be dealt with properly. But calling it an outbreak is like screaming fire in a theater, you know, when, when somebody lit a cigarette. And they did burn the, the bee yard <laughs> rather than burning one hive. You know, they, they, it, it was literally a scorched earth policy. So they, they took care of that. Now everybody in uh, West Tennessee is scared to death. They've got American fowl brood on the doorstep. Probably not. But uh, I only live about 30 miles from before this uh, outbreak happened, and I don't, uh, I hadn't lost a bit of sleep, it, it hadn't affected my appetite any, obviously. But, uh, anyway, if you're dealing with American fowl brood burning, uh, other brood diseases, get a vet feed director and fix it. You, you can fix it. Uh, that's, the, that's the quickest, easiest, and most effective fail-safe it's a fail-safe way of fixing it because that way you don't have to worry about the bees still vectoring that that uh, bacteria into the larva. Um, and like I said, I wish we didn't have to treat for anything with any chemical, but we live in a time where that that's uh, not always an option. If you keep your bees on your place. Don't move them around and nobody else moves bees in around you, you may not have to treat for anything. But when it comes when you start seeing these symptoms, don't be afraid to. That's like having chronic pain and, and being afraid to take a Tylenol. That's what it's for. So use the treatment when you need it. Other pests and parasites, raccoons are a big pest in my house. They will take the top off of a hive and pull frames out of it. And they were trained to do that in 2007 after we had the freeze at Easter when everything died, including the food that raccoons normally eat. And they all had babies that they were having to feed. And I had pollen patties on a lot of nukes. I had about 400 nukes on our farm that all had pollen patties on them until the coons found out that the pollen patties were something they could eat. And uh, we had a little war. And the coons won several battles, but they did not win the war. Um, so I thought that it was over with, you know. I thought, well, I'll whip them. Won't have to do this again. What I failed to understand was that they had taught their babies that this is where you come to get food. And their babies taught their babies that this is where you come to get food. So on my farm, still, you've got a nail top zone with one nail on each side of the top driven all the way in. Where coons are amazing <laughs> at what they can tear apart and what they can get into. And they're amazing at how much damage that they can do. And I'm sure that they think I'm amazing that I can blow them to smithereens from a hundred yards away. <laughs> All of that happens. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, they're, they're a problem at times. Skunks are a minor problem at our house because we have a lot of owls around our house. And owls love to eat skunks. And I love for owls to eat skunks. So we don't have much problem with skunks around our house. Wax moths are not that big of an issue, mostly because we keep all of our equipment occupied most of the time. And when it's not, it's stored where it's uh, got a lot of airflow and light. And we do have a few frames destroyed by wax moths every year, but nothing, nothing major. Um, small hive beetles. I absolutely hate small hive beetles. A queen right hive, uh, you, you've got to keep your hive queen right. As soon as a hive goes queenless, if there's not any larva in that hive, then small hive beetles will destroy it. That's, that's just what's going to happen. Because it doesn't matter how hygienic your bees are, as soon as there's no larva for them to take care of, everybody in there becomes a forager. Nobody's worried about cleaning the house. Everybody is going out and getting groceries. And small hive beetles will destroy the hive. If it goes queenless long enough that there's no open brood, that's 10 days. If your hive is queenless for more than 10 days, and that can happen without you realizing it. It does to me. I mean, I lose a hive or two every year uh, like this, but it's just part of it. And the only way to keep your sanity as a beekeeper is to learn to not beat yourself up over having a dead hive or a hive destroyed by hive beetles or a hive that gets uh, just decimated by viruses and bacteria, diseases, uh, brood diseases. It happens. And uh, you just you just pick up and go again. That's, that's all you can do. And I told uh, one group one time that beekeeping is like being a cowboy. <laughs> the only way you're going to keep remain a beekeeper is just to decide not to quit. You got to get back on the horse. And that's just the way it is when you lose a hive of bees. Learn from the loss. You're going to have hives that die in the winter. Over the winter, and there'll be a cluster of bees, all with their heads in the cells. They're not looking for feed. Those are the heater bees that just ran out of fuel and died. There'll be bees in between the frames. Those are the insulator bees that run out of fuel and died. There'll be honey this far from them. You might have 50 pounds of honey on a hive and a, a cluster of bees this big around dead that far from the honey. When it gets 30 degrees or lower, sometimes it don't even have to get all the way down to 30. The cluster is not going to move inside the hive. It's got to be in range of honey. It don't get so cold the bees can't move inside that cluster. But as long as there's honey within range of that cluster, they're okay. But when the cluster gets out of range of honey, they'll die in about two days. Regardless of the size of the cluster, they have about two days, maybe three, to live before they starve to death. But, you know, that, that's, that's how you do an autopsy on hives. Wasn't your fault. You just chalk that up to stupid bees. You know, they cluster in the wrong place. Um, if you have a hive that dies in the winter and there's not many bees, maybe just a handful that are, have their heads stuck in the cells and there's not many bees between the frames. They're all piled up on the bottom board. That's a symptom of a virus. They died because of a viral infection. And that, that's the difference between autopsy and two different scenarios of winter, a winter dead out. And if it was a virus issue, it still may not be your fault. Uh, the only way it's your fault is if you saw it and you decided not to do anything about it. Well, then you can go ahead and fill up a clod. You know, have permission to do that. But more than likely, it's going to be something that flies under the radar that you just never saw coming when you have a pile of dead bees on the bottom board. Um, pesticides, 
neonicotinoids, the seed coatings, all of those things, they're not good for bees. There's nothing you can do about it other than try to keep your bees away from, from uh, cultivated crops. Those things are things that we don't need to really be worrying about as much as the things we heck, that we can have some control over. The things that you have absolutely no control over, that should just uh, make, a, make a good point to you about how good you have to be at everything else. We have to be uh, as good as as good as we can possibly be at controlling what we can't control, because there's so many things that we can't anymore. Um, this I, I don't know. I sat at the table, and I bet out of the people that stopped to ask a question, I bet at least one out of three of them, maybe more. One there's a magazine there that said something about CCD. They wanted to know what CCD was. Colony collapse disorder. It's uh, it's an acronym for something that nobody ever really identified what it is. Colony collapse disorder can be anything. And the question was uh, earlier was uh, how much of it is man caused? I said 100% of it's man caused because we're the ones that brought all these pests and things here or at least allowed them to, to thrive here. And because we're the ones that move bees all over everywhere, nothing is, nothing is ever quarantined. There's no way to quarantine bees that have CCD. The bees that were first identified with CCD came from a larger operation and their bees went everywhere. So, of course, it, it's our fault for things like that. But beyond that, CCD is not anything new. There's been identical issues dating all the way back into the 1800s. So CCD is more a product of uh, us actually recognizing, wow, this is something, <laughs> this is something bad. Before it was like, well, poor old Joe. His bees all just left the hives. And now, since it happened to some of us, you know, all of a sudden it's serious. It's like uh, not being too concerned about uh, people in uh, people in on another continent. You know, Ebola wasn't a big deal to us until they brought a bunch of people that had it over here to treat them. And then it's like, whoa, we, we don't really need that stuff over here. And then all of a sudden, Ebola was a big deal. Same thing with CCD. CCD got to be a big deal because some of us started, started seeing symptoms of it. And it's been going on for a long time. It'll keep going on for a long time. And it probably won't ever be answered in a satisfactory way as to what causes it or what you can do to stop it. But you're not going to have CCD issues nearly as much, nearly as bad, if you stay ahead of varroa, stay ahead of bacterial and viral diseases, and make sure your hive stays clean right. There's good treatments for small hive beetles uh, that are not legal. <laughs> so if you come to my farm, uh, you might possibly see some of those. But I'm not going to describe them, and I'm not going to go into that because uh, it uh, might make some people unhappy. But uh, why do you, why in California I know that bees are transported a lot to for the almond yep. groves. Yeah. Did they just not raise enough bees in California, so they have to source them from uh, Kentucky? Right. Right now, there are somewhere around. Two million colonies of honeybees in the United States. That's that's just kind of a give or take. There's about two million. Uh, some people say 2.2 million colonies. It takes 1.9 million colonies just for almonds. Wow. California has about 500,000 colonies, and they have roughly one third or one fourth enough bees just for almonds. 
and all of these in California don't go to almonds. Uh, the almond industry is really hurting for bees to the point that uh, they're, they're trying every way possible to get around using bees to pollinate almonds. Yeah, I read they grafted a tree that doesn't have to be cross-pollinated. There's, uh, there's been there's been almonds that did not require an insect pollinator for about 30 years, but they're not fit to eat. Uh, and they keep working, trying to get a hybrid that is self-pollinated. That's, that's more feasible than them training a few beekeepers to expand colonies? Uh, you're talking about bureaucratic boardrooms. You're talking about guys, bankers and lawyers sitting yeah, in an air like conditioning office. Seems like I could place bottom line out on that a little faster than Yep. Not yep. Just no cowboy man. Well, uh, there's two things that are happening. One is nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. They're really pursuing that, and they're really pursuing uh, a self-pollinating almond that somebody might possibly eat. Oh, that'd be groundbreaking, no doubt. But in the yeah. meantime, in the meantime, uh, they're paying whatever you ask almost. Every year it's the same. It starts off being, well, uh, you can contract your bees for $155 per hive for almonds. That's in September. And then November gets here and they say, you can contract your bees for $175 a hive for almonds. And January gets here and they say, you can contract your bees for $195 per hive for almonds. And then February gets here and almonds are beginning to bud up a little bit and they say, gosh, we ain't got enough bees. We'll pay you $240 a hive for your, for your bees for almonds. And then the bloom starts and they say, if you've got a five frame nuke, we'll pay you $300 for it. And, I mean, it just keeps going up the ladder. It's a panic every year. It's, a, it's the same thing for the last 10 years, it's been this way. It's a panic that sets up when the bloom starts opening because they couldn't entice enough people to send bees to almonds. The truth is there's not enough people to send, there's not enough bees. If you want to, this is the perfect time to get into commercial beekeeping and actually make a living at it because there's so much room and people that uh, are hobbyists or small sideliner beekeepers think that it's something that they can't do, they're wrong. Ten, ten small beekeepers that have uh, 40 hives apiece, 50 hives apiece, can put all of it together, hire a broker, get it. The broker will do everything for you. And you don't have to even touch the bees. You don't have to go to California, I'd recommend you did just to make sure that everything gets put where it's supposed to and gets put back where it's supposed to be and comes back home. But uh, you don't have to stay out there. The broker will arrange for all of it for a fee. Hire the, hire the things done that you can't do. Small beekeepers can do this. You just have to work together. And there's money to be made in, in this if you're willing to do it. And last year's first year I've ever seen any bees to almonds. And uh, that's what enticed me to go. Actually, I went because I had talked another fellow into sending his bees and he was about to back out. And I was goading him in, I was trying to goad him into uh, going. And I said, well, I'll, if you're not going to go, I will. And then he said, well, if you're going, I'll go. Well, then I was trapped. I had to go then. So anyway. Uh, I wound up really liking it, though. I'll, I'll have to admit that uh, it was very worthwhile, financially and, and for the experience, too. What's the Georgia herd? How's it compared to the California bee population? Uh, Georgia's bee population is pretty good because you've got a lot of professional beekeepers in Georgia. <laughs> Florida's bee population is really good. Because you got any state that you've got a lot of professional beekeepers in, in it, they're going to keep the population static because they have to. That's their living. 
uh, our hive numbers stay pretty much, you know, pretty much the same where we want them anyway, because we have to. And somebody that has 20 hives in their backyard, it's not it's not going to mean getting the electricity shut off if, if 10 of them die and you don't replace them. And so losing 50% of your bees is not nearly as catastrophic for a sideline beekeeper. But you also don't make your living. You don't make your house payment doing that. Or don't you don't make your disposable income doing that. So the large beekeepers keep everything on an even keel. The smaller beekeepers are kind of like this. And the hobby beekeepers are really good customers for everybody. The nanotechnology that I was talking about is the craziest part of this whole thing because there are drones that are the I, I, I can't wrap my brain around this because I'm, I'm just an old redneck hillbilly. And I can't wrap my brain around a drone the size of a mosquito that with, with artificial intelligence that will recognize blooms. The problem they're having is recognizing blooms that have or have not been pollinated. And it's crazy. But those, those are the things that, that the almond industry had rather throw money at instead of uh, building a beekeeping industry back up. And the beekeeping industry needs to be built up from the ground, not from the commercial end of it. It needs to be built up by training sideliners into becoming beekeepers. There's a lot of kids out there that are in high school that have no, no practical need to go to college. Maybe they don't even want to go to college. They don't have any idea what direction they want to go, but they would make great beekeepers. Kids with an agricultural background that don't want to get into the rat race of renting land and, and buying half a million dollar combines, uh, it don't cost that much to get into commercial beekeeping on a level where that you could actually make a living at it. And that's where the almond industry and the beekeeping industry also need to be focusing is on the young people that could be coming up and taking the place of the of the commercial beekeepers that are retiring because commercial beekeeping is getting old age-wise that's my pitch for beekeeping <laughs> average age of the farm creeps up about six uh, six months every uh, census we take it's now 57.6 months you know, that may be the only thing I'm above average at. <laughs> I was just backing up your point. Uh, no, you, you, uh, just, almost you just, almost five o'clock hours, or another question for Kent? You just gave me a lot of encouragement. I am above average. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 